without further ado, I'm going to do the introductions for our presenters and we'll get on with tonight's program. So Joanne Gonzalez Hickey is an art collector who's built a significant collection of contemporary abstract works on paper over the past 13 years. Part of the mission of the collection is to promote a deeper understanding of the nature of works on paper, all while exploring the question, what is drawing? As part of this, she has established Syzygy, a curatorial and study platform that extends the collection to graduate students and curators as a, resource for, as a resource for scholarly research and project development, including studies in specific art genre, studio art, poetry, and creative writing, curatorial practice, and neuroscience. Flux is a graduate student at CU Boulder with a decade's worth of research in fields spanning from molecular biology to human behavior. He's worked in over a dozen research laboratories, working in fields from molecular biotechnology to primate physiology and is currently working on a joint PhD in clinical psychology and neuroscience. His research revolves around stress resiliency and mental health. He's also worked as an artist in several different capacities with his current artistic outlet being creating illustrations for his science presentations, including tonight's. Marty Goff is an independent curator and curatorial advisor for Gould Art Advisory. She's been working as a curator for over 10 years and has worked for contemporary art, uh, for art institutions locally and internationally, including the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art, the National Gallery in London, the Denver Art Museum, and the Peggy Guggenheim Collection in Venice, Italy. She holds an MA from Cortland Institute of Art in London and earned a BA in Art History from the US University of Colorado at Boulder. We're really pleased to have all three of them here to share their expertise with you tonight. We're very excited about this program and this collaboration with CMC, and we think it's going to be a fascinating program. I'd like to invite Joanne to come up and say a few words about tonight's program, and then we'll jump into it. Thank you so much for being here. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Uh, I, I want to thank the Vail Symposium and Colorado Mountain College for hosting us. It's been a, a dream collaboration. We um, feel very privileged to be here, to have you here and have your interest and to share with you some of the exploring we've been doing, the three of us. I started collecting 13 years ago, as you read in your program. However, 10 years ago, I had a most profound experience with a very specific drawing. That led me to begin to question my aesthetic. What is feeding my aesthetic? It was apparent to me that it was much more than what I had thought. So tonight's program is going to take us to, through this. And in the end, I'm going to tell you about some of those profound experiences I've had so you'll understand um, the deeper regions we can reach in looking at art and being with art, bringing ourselves to the looking as the individuals we are. I met Marty Goff a few years ago. She's a curator who has extensively studied my collection, knows it well, and she knows my collecting practice, which is somewhat unique. It's very individual and private. And then we put out a, a, a call for a neuroscientist because I was very interested in the unconscious memory, and Flux is going to correct that term, but I had a, a hunch that there was something in the unconscious that was feeding my aesthetic. And so I wanted to begin to explore neuroscience and deeper understanding of how the, how the aesthetic works. And Flux answered that call, and we've been working with him for a couple of years. So when... Um, when the Vail Symposium approached me about showing my collection, I suggested we have um, an evening of this nature where together we can understand more about the art of observing, how to look effectively so that we maximize for ourselves that experience, and also exactly what is happening in the brain that guides the aesthetic. So I'd like to bring Flux up. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, gets on. Thank you, Joanne, for your kind words. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be on stage in front of you tonight. Uh, I have been working on this presentation. Well, we have been working on this presentation for eight months now, uh, and it's been quite a labor of love. I'd again really like to thank the Vail Symposium, Colorado Mountain College. Uh, this has been a wonderful opportunity. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so as uh, my introduction went, I am a scientist. Uh, and so as a scientist, I thought we could start this presentation with a little experiment. So I want you to think, if you can, of the Mona Lisa. Just conjure an image in your head. What do you see? 
Maybe you see her smile, the way her hair falls down onto her shoulders. Maybe it's the backdrop. All those tiny details. I imagine it probably looked something like this. Now, I'd want you to do the same thing, but with one of the images that was circling on loop before the presentation. Can you do it? How many can you think of? Each of those images was being displayed for 17 seconds. 17 seconds is the amount of time, according to a paper published in the year 2000, that the average person spent in front of a piece of art at the Met. 17 seconds. Do you know how long it takes to brush your teeth? The average person takes at least 45 seconds to do that. So what are we missing? You know, what are we missing when we're not looking? And why can we pull up images of famous pieces of artwork, but not ones that we cross paths with during the day? Now, to talk about this a little deeper on a neuroscience level, I'd like to do a second experiment. And it's going to involve a video. Hopefully, it will play this time. So just, uh, there's some instructions in the video. Just follow along. It's very short. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? <laughs> Some of them have, yeah. This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. So I could tell from some of the chuckles that some of you saw the gorilla, but then I could also tell from some other like aha moments that you didn't see the gorilla. Um, now this is a really interesting example. Some people see it, some people don't. It depends on your attention, what you're looking at. Um, and there's a term for it in neuroscience. Uh, it's called cognitive load. And so things that have a high cognitive load are the things that we end up putting all of our attention into. So in this case, it was counting the passes. And when you put all of your attention into one thing that takes up a high cognitive load, other things, which are termed low cognitive loads, don't take up any attention. So the gorilla, in this instance, was a low cognitive load, which was why some of you didn't see it, because you were putting all of your energy into counting the passes. Now, we could talk about the same thing when it comes to observing art, or paying attention to the world around us even. You know, for most people who walk into a museum, the high cognitive load is their cell phone. <laughs> How many Instagram followers do they have? What their newest Facebook post says? You know, someone just texted them, what emails? But the art becomes the gorilla. The art is that low cognitive load. And that's what we're not paying attention to because our attention is elsewhere. But the trick is how do we reverse it? How do we make it so that all those distractions become the low cognitive load and we turn the art into the high cognitive load? And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I'm going to hand this off to my friend Marty, and she's going to discuss different ways that the art world has kind of taken a look at this issue and strategies that have been implemented to try and you know, captivate our attention away from the very obnoxious and noisy machines that we hold in our hands. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to Marty right now. Is my mic on now? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right. This is the first time that I've worn one of these, and it's in my pocket, so I'm going to try not to. <laughs> it is going to move around. I'm going to sit for a second then.
So, many of you probably did not see these images as they flashed in front of you. And actually, it's probably not a big deal. In fact, it probably points to the fact that you are very apt at surviving in the world that we live in today. With so many images that are flashed in front of us, the fact that we have the ability to discriminate what we look at is actually a survival technique. Today, we're really living in a visual world. And actually, vision has become our master sense. 65% of the population comprises visual learning. 90% of information transmitted to the brain is done visually. 36,000 visual images per hour is what we're capable of actually seeing. And it only takes 50 milliseconds for people to form their first impression. Which is quite interesting. All of these statistics actually come from different sources that are marketing, branding, all ways in which to capture attention. So as we are inundated with so many images, it would make sense why we wouldn't necessarily pull out the images flashing on the screen. However, with all of this technology, information, we are overwhelmed. We are constantly inundated with information, unable, at least for myself, to keep up with your emails. We're technically in a more connected world, yet none of this is face to face. People are feeling isolated. People are feeling overwhelmed. Like they can't connect, they can't stop, they can't enjoy the moment, they just have to react to the immediate. And when you think about this and you think about survival, there is a very inventive force out there at the center of our society that is there to tend to these needs. That is art. And art is there for us to feel more connected to other humans, to take a moment and step away from all of the things flashing around us and actually look at our visual surroundings. And we like to be distracted. We busy ourselves with our everyday. What art does is offer an interruption and allow us to think about what it means to be human. Well, we still have to get from all of these images that are around and that was a little bit longer than I thought pull out these, but the point of tonight is actually not pulling out these. It's pulling out this. You can look at the work right there. Um, part of the point of this lecture tonight is to remind us that it is about connecting to one work of art, not all of the works of art, just one, and having an experience with it in its physical presence. Now, many of us have probably had the experience of a work of art, whether it be a song, poem, even a delicious meal that has moved us in some way. If you haven't, come along with me and pretend that you have. We're going to pull on that and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna run with that. Can you not hear me? I can speak louder. Do you need to turn me up or just speak louder? Better? Okay, cool. You keep doing that if I need to go up, all right? <laughs> Oh, that's why that didn't happen. Now at large, we value in culture, society at large, art. There are museums in every major city. There are more and more and more and more and more popping up every year. In fact, Art Price um, has given a statistic that since 2007, 700 museums open up annually. That is more in 14 years than has happened in two centuries. Museums are having record attendance. We see lines around the block. One of those actually was at the National Gallery when I worked there and it was a mile long. And if we look at American Speaks Out about the arts, did a very important survey where they did a very large national poll. 63% of Americans believe the arts provide meaning to our lives. 64% feel the arts give them pure pleasure to experience and participate in. 73% say that the arts are a positive experience in a troubled world. Yet, yeah, if you look 
at the way that people are actually participating in museums. Yes, the crowds are there, but are they looking at the art? The uh, survey that Flux was talking about was a very seminal survey in museum studies that said that people were coming to museums, they were walking around, and on average looking at works of art for 17 seconds. Yet, on their way out, their experience of the museum was described as outstanding, breathtaking, important, wonderful, meaningful. So this led these researchers, Smith and Smith, to ask this question in a seminal publication. How can people be so deeply moved by works of art that they have hardly viewed? Or they viewed so briefly? I'm going to take a sip of water, too. Um, it's a very good question, isn't it? And it leads to other questions. What is our understanding of our experience of art? How are we giving it this important, valuable space when we're not actually connecting with the work? You might start to think, what is an idea of an experience that we think that we're having? And is this at the expense of actually having one? I would argue that most of us are not. And I do not think that it's the masses, the public. I think that it's arts professionals. I think that it is um, even the artists at times, that we're not actually connecting with the work. Now, I don't think that this is entirely our fault. In fact, there's a lot that surrounds art, the whole establishment of art, that while it's well-intended, it gives us access to the work, takes care of it, gives us the space to view it. We are not actually given the opportunity to intuitively connect. We've almost over-institutionalized art. Most of our experience of art is enacted in a public space. So whether that's a museum, Instagram, or culture at large, we need to understand that within these public spaces, these were all built and maintained by humans. And with that comes human bias. And there, any information and any of the way that it's getting structured is being structured by another person. We also need to understand that when we talk about art, it exists within a world. And it's been very creatively coined, the art world. But all of these worlds are actually different worlds that are coming together. So we have curators, gallerists, um, critics, academics. Um, you know, the list goes on with different professions. It's becoming more and more niche. And all of these people are essentially in charge of what art gets put into the canon of art history, what art we get to see, and how we see it. And even within the most sacred of spaces, so the museum, for instance, there's a lot of opinions that are imposed on your experience. And understanding and identifying some of these are important um, to acknowledging how you actually get close to the work of art. So when you walk into a museum, the building itself, constructs the way that you might understand or appreciate the art, the way that the art is arranged, what other art is next to it, the label that is connected with it. The audio guides. And then we have the rest of the things that surround the art world. So the where it sits inside of culture, where it sits inside of these other deciding factors. And they're placing value on the art, literally, monetarily, which is also creating sensation. For instance, you can see at the top here, Salvador Mundi, a painting by Leonardo da Vinci, sold last year for $450 million, shattering records. We have Instagram, which is now a platform that a, a majority of people are actually experiencing art through. We have the celebrities that are connected to it. All of these things are actually um, putting it through the lens of quantity, though. If you look at the way that Instagram has undoubtedly influenced the way that we experience art, for better and worse, I could go into the good, but right now I'm going to go into the bad. Um, this idea that value is placed on the actual visibility. So how many works are seen? So the quantity of what you're seeing. And quantity gets translated not only into the monetary value of something, but also in the way that museums are conducting their visitor analysis. 
museums are looking at data retrieved from their audiences. They are looking at um, attendance numbers. Again, all of this is quantity. None of this is quality. So if we try and just say that there are these other structures that are imposing opinions on our understanding, how then do we actually connect with the work of art? I would suggest that a lot of the structures that surround the museum and our experience relate very closely to human nature, our desire to categorize, to identify, to understand things. We don't like to not know things. And we easily are relying on the information that's being provided to us. And what I am suggesting is that we step away from that and that we actually connect with the work of art and understand that it's probably asking a lot at first. It's challenging. But so is looking inside of yourself. So. Um, this is a current movement and a trend within the art world that is picking up steam. And what it's asking is for us to recognize that not only are these quantifiable measures that are controlling our experience, there are also, there's also an immediacy that we're being asked to have. Um, you know, Instagram is certainly that. Our posts are very quick. They disappear very quickly. And this sort of immediacy is translating to the way that we experience art. At large, most people walk into a museum with a list to conquer, rather than any expectation of what their experience is going to be. And if you think about the fact that if you did this in a library, so for instance, you walked into a library, and you browsed the shelf, and you looked at the spines of the books, would you then later tweet or post that you had read 100 books that day? No. And that is what I'm trying to kind of reiterate back to art. And the fact of the matter is, is that we need to spend more time. And what happens when we spend more time? The slow art movement actually was, um, has a day that goes along with it. And this was started by someone that had nothing to do with the art world. And he was dragged to a museum by his wife. And he ended up sitting in front of this painting by Hans Hoffman. And he found himself sitting there for an hour. And the experience that he had, being a CEO of another business, he decided that it was important to give this, you know, that everyone should really be experiencing it. That you can't actually understand what that experience is until you've had it. No one can think, feel, read, write, tell you an experience. You have to have it. So, he started Slow Art Day, which is a movement that has, was started in 2009 and has just increasingly become more prevalent in more institutions across six continents. Um, all of these countries, this was the last time it happened in April. And museums institute programming on this day, and they can also do it in other parts of the, the year, um, that advocate for slowing down, spending time with a work of art, and finding the enjoyment in art. Now, Art and Read recently published, this was published last year, um, a book called Slow Art. And he goes a little bit deeper into this as to what slow looking really is. And if we, we start to think about art not as an object, but as the experience, it is the thing that is between the object and the viewer. And that experience is something to be performed. It is something that takes time to unfold. And if you think about it as more like time-based media, like a film or music, in the way that we allow things to unfold over time, that is what is being advocated in this movement, and by me and Joanne and Flux, um, that you can actually find a great deal of information. And the possibility of finding information within a work of art is actually infinite. There are a million ways of reading it. And if you spend time looking and understanding and visually taking in the reasons for a certain brush stroke, for a certain color use, for the way that something is structured, that you actually might learn more about yourself. 
So taking time and getting close and looking is one thing. But the other thing we have to remember is that vision is somewhat deceptive. Seeing is not perceiving. So how do we look at works of art to see what is not actually on the surface? And what is a work of art telling us? The potential to understand more about yourself, uh, pulling into what Flux hates, <laughs> the unconscious. But <laughs> the idea that there are these other things in our brain that we're not accessing most of the time. The truth is, we spend most of our day in our conscious being, replaying the same thing over and over and over again. Art allows that break. It allows that pause. It allows you to think back on things maybe you didn't know, recall things you didn't know. It also allows you to connect with another human being. Another quote here. <laughs> um, Salvation must grow out of um, understanding, total understanding, can follow only from total experience. An experience must be won by the laborious disciplines shaping one's absolute attention. So this requires a little bit of work, but the benefits actually have the ability to be more energizing. They have the ability to connect us back to the world around us, to think about the question we don't often want to think about or distract ourselves from, and that is what it means to be human. And in this moment, Oh, and also, if you look long enough, you'll probably find something interesting about it. So, an exercise worth trying either way. So what can we find in a work of art? What's there? And actually, it connects very, again, all of this is so basic. But it is connecting and making us feel less alone in this world. It's a conversation with an artist. Potentially, it's the ability to see something beautiful in ordinary life. Maybe it's serenity that we seek. Maybe it's love that we seek. Maybe it's contemplating the struggles of human existence. I encourage you to open this conversation with an artist. And this is Marie Abramovich, who very literally <laughs> demonstrates my, um, my um, point um, as she's sitting across from visitors at MoMA. But artists have also been thinking about all of these things that make us human, all of the emotions that surround it. And there's a lot to be learned in that. There's also a lot to be learned from the fact that the creative process doesn't stop with the artist. The creative process is actually enacted as well as a viewer. So thinking about this and that ability to open yourself up to the conversation at least and look deeper, there are different tools that we can apply to looking. There's different prompts. Museums around the country have various different ones that they follow. But tonight, we're going to follow one. And I'm going to ask you to just look at a work of art and not say anything. And we'll come back to it later. But if you can focus on this work on the back wall here. And starting with the surface appeal, you ask yourself the question, what do you see? So just think about it. What are the colors? What are the surfaces? What are the gestures? How many of these panels are there? Then ask yourself, what do you think? How was it made? What kind of brush was he using? Do we think he's talking about anything specific? And then ask yourself, what does it make you wonder? And we'll come back to this. But first, what we're going to do is look inside the brain <laughs> and see how it is that we're actually responding to this. And what are the possible connections that can be made looking from a neurological perspective into what it means to connect on a deeper level with a work of art, with yourselves, and with each other. All right. Thank you. If you give me one second, the clicker died while Marty was holding it, and I just got a new battery. 
there. Should have gone to that. That's why it didn't progress. <laughs> so as Marty says, let's take a look inside the brain. Like, what's, what's going on when we're connecting? Um, and you know, what, what led for this whole like, brain shape image to be in there? Um, so what I'd like to start with is a bit of a radical idea. And that is the idea that viewing art can use your whole brain. Um, many people might not think about it that way. Uh, the brain, in fact, is divided into many different pieces um, that are all kind of functional units and they do different things. And I'd like to talk about a lot of the different parts of the brain that can become activated depending on what you're connecting with and how. Uh, and so to do that, I'm going to bring back our friend the gorilla. And we're going to use him as an example. So just look at the piece. What does it make you think of? What's coming up in your brain? And for most of you, the first thing that is going on is that you're seeing it. The image is going from your retina, and it's traveling all the way through your optic nerve to the back of your head to an area known as the occipital lobe, or the primary visual center. And it's in this place that the images are just processed, just what you see, nothing else. And the longer you look, that information is traveling from the back of your head around the sides and up along the top on these supplementary visual areas. And what's really interesting is that each of these areas has subregions that respond to very specific components. We have an area that responds to faces. Uh, so looking at the monkey, you might notice that he has a face. There's a nose, there are eyes, there's a mouth. And there is actually a region of your brain that is becoming more active because you see a face. Uh, there are regions that are involved with color. Uh, you'd notice that his hair is blue. There are all these different components um, of recognition that goes higher and higher and higher. Uh, you know, it starts with very simple shapes like circles and squares and then goes all the way to these complex representations. Um, and you're using huge portions of your brain. And the majority of the back of our brain is dedicated to our visual center. Um, but so seeing this, the next step might be that it affects your memory. So where does that go? Well, interestingly, a bit deeper into the brain, there is a region called the hippocampus, which is our memory center. Now, the hippocampus is really interesting because it doesn't quite store memories. Our memories are kind of collections all over our brains. But it helps us to know which piece goes where. It's kind of like the switchboard that allows you to know where to go. Uh, and so the hippocampus uh, sees, you know, gets information from the visual system that you're looking at an ape or a gorilla. And then it starts to make associations. Where have you seen this before? What does it make you think of? And suddenly, it's activating all of these other regions of your brain. For example, um, let's close that up. Uh, we've got the olfactory center, smell. Smell is actually, uh, your sense of smell has the most direct route to your brain. It doesn't get rerouted through other areas. And so senses of smell can be very strong memories. And so looking at this monkey, you might think of bananas. You might think of the smell of a banana. Or maybe you were at a zoo and you might Think of the smell of the cage and how terrible it smelled. You know, those memories are being activated by the visual information that went in. And in addition to that, we have other regions of the brain, like our auditory center. And the auditory center is what we hear. And so maybe you're remembering the hoots of monkeys at a zoo. Um, or maybe you're thinking of something completely different because your brain has gone off on a crazy tangent that's somehow related. Uh, additionally, we also have a region of our brain that's dedicated to taste, known as the gustatory center. Maybe you're thinking about what a banana tastes like. And all of these things can be activated just by seeing something that then goes to memory. Additionally, we have an area called the somatosensory center, which is basically our touch center. And that can be activated by looking at the fur. You can remember what it felt like to run your fingers through a dog's fur or through someone's hair that was the same color, blue. Uh, and uh, additionally, there's even uh, ways for your motor centers to be activated. Not necessarily to get you moving, but to think about moving. Maybe you were attacked by a pack of monkeys and had to run down the street, and you're remembering that. I don't know. Uh, that would be a very interesting life. Uh, and so all of these sensory areas that are being activated by these memories kind of then coalesce into the front part of our brain. Now, the front part of our brain is... Uh, one of the most complex, it's what makes us human. And 
helps us to put everything in context, helps us to kind of relate things to ourselves, helps us to understand high-level concepts like reward and value and judgment. And all of the sensory information in these memories go into this one spot and help us to put it all into our own personal context. And this is just a small tour of some brain regions that are easy to understand and you might be familiar with. There is an entire brain that is dedicated to understanding all of these things. And it is continuously active. And the more you use your brain, and the more that you have it stimulated, and you think about things, and you ruminate, and go on and on and on, the more we're able to activate our whole brain. And if you give it the chance, art can do that, which is super cool. Now, we know that art can activate the brain, but then what do you do with that? Right? So the question is, how do we connect? What is the next step beyond just activating a bunch of memories. I'd like to talk to you today about three different ways to connect with art. It's probably not the only three, um, but it's the three that after I did a bunch of research, you know, really seemed to make the most sense to present. Um, the first is focus. The second I'll be talking about is context. And then the final one that I'll be discussing is making a personal connection. Uh, three very different ways to get at a connection in three completely unique circumstances. So let's start with focus. I'd like to talk about a couple brain regions that are involved with focus, but first I want to kind of focus, the term focus. Uh, I want to, uh, the way many of us think about focus is not always the same way that neuroscientists think about focus. And so um, there's generally two ways to focus on things when you think about it. One is to focus internally. I'm focusing on my life. I'm focusing on what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm focusing on what I ate for dinner. Um, and the other is external, where you're really focusing on your environment. Uh, you're seeing the colors, the shades, the textures, the sounds, and spending a lot of time really kind of projecting that focus. And on a neuroscience level, that's generally what we're referring to when we're talking about focus. And there's a couple key brain areas that all play different roles in allowing us to make those types of focuses. Uh, oh yeah, we're gonna talk about that. Uh, so the first is certain areas of the prefrontal cortex. So that brief prefrontal region that we talked about before, um, it actually has a lot of different components. Um, and it's pretty complicated, um, but one of them, it's called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but you don't have to remember that. Uh, is very much about paying attention to your external world. It's about orienting a person to what's around them uh, and directing attention to external things. Um, and in collection with that, we have another region that's a bit deeper in the brain. It's known as the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, this is kind of like the brain's alarm system. It allows us to know when things are wrong. It detects errors. Um, it's part of a network called the salience network. It helps us to really pay attention to things that are salient to us. Um, it helps direct our focus to things that are critical for survival or just important to our own interests. And then the final region that kind of goes into this collection is known as the locus ceruleus, or the blue spot. Um, and the locus ceruleus is a tiny spot in the brainstem, but it sends out projections all over the brain. And amazingly, it basically helps tune the region of your brain that needs to focus on what you need to look at or pay attention to. It, through a distributed network, just kind of changes the way that you perceive the world to focus on specific things. And together, these three regions and a couple others all go into helping us to pay attention to our external environment. And what's really interesting about this is that these regions play a crucial role in something you may have heard of, known as mindfulness. Mindfulness and meditation make use of the same circuits that would be involved with paying explicit, detailed attention to a work of art. And mindfulness, in and of itself, is able to extend our focus outward. It helps us to uh, be more aware of our environment. And it also helps us to decrease emotionality and increase calm. 
And so in the same way that having a mindfulness practice of you know, sitting and just kind of paying attention to your breaths allows you to focus and to feel renewed, um, art can do the exact same thing. Art can be a transcendent experience in the same way that meditation is, which is truly incredible. You know, my roommate uh, kind of turned me on to this because uh, I was talking to her about this talk several months ago, and uh, I was really kind of honing in on some of my ideas, and she was like, Flux, I don't, I don't connect with art like that at all. And she told me this story about how she went to the Met and she sat in front of a Jackson Pollock painting for three hours until she had to be escorted off by security. And, and she just, she was like, it was the most meaningful experience that she can have. And she has gone back time after time again and sat in front of the same piece and just stared at it. And I asked her, I said, what's going through your head? Are you thinking about what it means to you? What's going on? And she said, no. She said, I'm just looking at the colors, I'm looking at the shapes. I'm just taking in everything in front of me. And it helps me to achieve this incredible sense of calm. It's one of the ways that art can be truly powerful. But I'd like to shift our focus and talk a little bit about context. So context, especially with what Marty was discussing, is key. Right? There is an entire art world in which professionals spend countless hours understanding value and history and where a painting comes from and learning about the artist and being able to uh, understand this whole collection of context that surrounds a single work of art. And you don't necessarily need that to connect to art, but is there something there? Is there something specific to the way an art professional who spends their life understanding art connects to a work of art, as opposed to a casual observer? And to talk about that, I'd like to bring up a study that was done uh, in which they took a casual observer and they showed them this painting. And then they took an art professional and they showed them this painting. And the very interesting thing was that they measured the person's eye movements. They saw where the person was looking. There's fancy eye trackers that can figure out where your gaze is. And the difference is, astound is astounding. So let's start with the casual observer. So this little orange dot right here is going to be our eye movement. So pretend that that's where you're looking. It's going to move around the screen, and we're going to see what part of the painting the casual observer looked at. Yeah, it stays right in the center. They just kind of look briefly and then move on. What's the difference with someone who has experience with the art world? Here we've got our same dot again. It's time to pay attention to how it moves. They took in the entire piece, every aspect, understanding, trying to figure out what was going on. What's amazing is that there's actually a brain region that facilitates this. It's a region known as the posterior parietal cortex, somewhere kind of around the top of your head, more towards the back. And this region of the brain allows people, or allows someone, to take in the entire gestalt of what you're looking at. Basically to absorb all of the key components, to be able to look at everything and tie it together into a unified whole that can be understood. Additionally, another region that is often active in art professionals' minds is something called the orbitofrontal cortex, another part of that big frontal cortex period piece. But this one has a very specific role in that it allows us to understand value. Um, it's the same region that's involved with understanding the value of money, as well as understanding tasty food, uh, whether that chocolate cake is really appetizing or not. Um, and for someone who has spent their life understanding the cultural and societal value of a piece of work, a piece of art, this region of their brain is a lot more active when they're observing artwork. And it's allowing them to make a judgment value on how they perceive what they're looking at. Now, from here, 
we go to one more brain region. It's called the insula. Insula is deep in the folds, kind of in the front, more in, you've got them on both sides. Um, insula does a lot of things. I'm actually going to talk about it a bit more in a bit. Um, but for now, just think about it as an area that determines our preferences. Uh, so we've gone from taking in the whole image to then making a value judgment to then determining if you like it or not. And that whole progression is something that art professionals take a lot of time with. So let's kind of talk about that too in comparison to the casual observer. So the casual observer takes a look at this piece of art, looks in the middle, and they make a preference. They go right to their insula, they figure out whether they like it or not. Whereas the difference for the art professional is that they take in the entire gestalt, they look at everything, then they take their knowledge and allow them to make a value judgment about what they think, where it falls on the scales, and then they make a preference. What's really interesting, though, about the preference of an art professional or someone who has a background in art is that there is a stronger emotional connection to the art that they have taken the time to understand and learn about than there is in someone who is casually just looking at it and making a brief preference. It's how knowledge and understanding of context really allows us to make deep-seated understanding judgments and values and preferences for the art that we're looking at. Context really is key if it comes to understanding value, especially in a world that's so obsessed with it. Finally, I'd like to talk about personal connection. This happens to be my favorite. Uh, and it is incredibly powerful when we're able to make a personal connection with what we're looking at. But just to give you an idea of how complex that, com that connection is, I'd like to talk about a study that came out of NYU that involved brain scans. So here we've got our brain scanner. And they took a very large number of pieces of art. Uh, I think it was something like 90. Um, and they would display them to the individuals who were in the brain scanner. So the person would see the piece of art, and then they would look at it for a period of time, and then they would be asked, how much did this move you? It was a scale of one to four, with four being the most moving. And what happened in response to that basic experiment was incredible. These are some of the brain images that came from that original paper. What they found was that for people who made incredibly moving connections with art, an entire different brain network was activated than any of the other ratings. Once they got to a four, this very special brain network was activated. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, because it's one of my favorite brain networks. It's made up of a lot of different areas, so I'm not going to name them all, but I'm going to give you a brief tour. So we've got a couple on the outside of the brain. We've got a couple if we look on the inside of the brain. And if you put them all together, you have a brain network that's known as the default mode network. It's a funny name, and it has an interesting story. So back when functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, or brain scanning, was first developed, we would put people in the scanner and we'd have them do things. Watch a movie, think about things, drink juice. There's a lot of different studies that have been done in, in fMRI machines. And in between experiments, oftentimes, the people would get a break. Um, it would be too much to take them out because they're, they're all wired up and stuff. So they just kind of sit there. And in that period of time, when nothing was happening, and they were just staring at the white ceiling of the tube of the brain scanner, a very special network was activated. And it was incredibly perplexing, because scientists would look at these activations and they'd say, nothing is happening. Like, why, why is there so much activity in this person's brain? Like, they're not doing the task. And so they called it the default mode network, because they assumed that, wow, nothing's happening, so it must just be the default. 
for some reason, our brains just go into this really weird, highly active state whenever we're not doing anything. Uh, I don't really know why they would think that. But um, as it turns out, it isn't that nothing is happening. It's that we are reflecting on ourselves. You know what happens when you have a free moment of time and you're not practicing mindfulness? You're thinking about your day. You're thinking about your Aunt Susie's birthday, or you're thinking about where you're going to go to dinner with your best friend on Friday, or you've had a random memory of something that happened in your childhood and now you're trying to figure it out. You know, we think about ourselves, we reflect, we move back on who we are as people in all of our free moments. And so this network, as it turns out, with more experimentation and more studies, is one that is unique to our understanding of ourselves. It is how we see the world through the lens that is us. And what's incredible is that art can also activate this network. So what does that mean? Well, art can be a mirror. When we see something that moves us, it moves us so deeply that it touches the part of ourselves that is unique to us. It activates a piece of us that understands who we are. When we're moved by art, we are seeing a piece of ourselves in the work. This is incredible. You know, if people knew that going to a museum was like looking through a bunch of mirrors, I think people would spend a lot more time there. <laughs> people love looking at themselves. Um, but this is not all. There's one more piece that I really want to share. Um, and we're going to be returning back to a brain region I mentioned before. It's called the insula. The insula, as I alluded to, is a really confusing brain region. Um, it does a lot of things. Uh, it's, it's very multi-purpose. Um, one of those things is understanding your internal feelings, like how your body feels. Um, it's called interoception. It is the butterflies in your stomach. It is the pit in your stomach. It is when you just feel off inside. Those sensations are all in the insula. But in addition to that, the insula is also, oh, there's the butterflies. Uh, the insula is also where our taste or our taste um, sensory uh, sensation is. So information from the taste buds in your tongue travel to the insula, and the insula encodes our taste. Now, what I always think is really interesting is that the insula not only encodes our taste from our tongue, it also encodes our preferences and tastes about what we like. It makes total sense that we would call our preferences our taste. Um, it's in the same brain region. But in addition to that, the insula has one other function. It processes pain. When we have physical pain or heartache, it's being processed in the insula. And so this is really interesting because the insula not only responds to when we are in pain, it also responds when we see others in pain. Now, it would be reductive to say that empathy is in the insula, because empathy is probably in a lot of places. But empathy probably is a large part of some of the activity that's in the insula. Being able to understand how others feel, feeling the pain of others, is partially in the insula. So what does that mean for art? If feeling deeply moved by art activates a region of the brain that's involved in empathy. Interestingly, there was a study that showed that people who are more empathetic tend to make stronger connections with art. Now, the question I'd like to pose to you is, can we become more empathetic by learning to connect with art? I'd like to introduce someone that you have already met and that many of you know, 
Her name is Joanne. She has founded Syzygy, that through which we connect, a platform for study of how we connect with art and understand those connections. Joanne has an amazing way of connecting with the pieces that she collects. And getting to know her over the past year and a half has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, but I will let her uh, talk about her own experiences. So please welcome Joanne and Marty back to the stage. So I, I, I said in the beginning that I had a profound experience. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Um, can you flip? This drawing, which I bought about 10 years ago, the experience I had with it forever changed my collecting practice. And now much of what I do is based on that experience, which has led to this discussion this evening. I first saw this drawing at the Betty Cunningham Gallery in Chelsea, New York. I have a pretty decisive aesthetic. I can walk into a room, see 20 paintings. There's one I'm going to go to, and one I'm going to feel strongly about, maybe. And this was the one. I walked up to it, found a powerful feeling about it, and I heard music. Sometimes when I look, I hear. Sometimes when I look, I taste. Sometimes when I look, I feel. And sometimes when I look, I smell. This one brought music to my mind, powerfully. And I knew I had a connection to it, and I wanted to own it. It's in my home. An artist comes to visit me. She sees the drawing hanging and says, oh, that's my friend Annette Lawrence's drawing. Have you met Annette? I said, no. She said, I'll make that happen. So you look at the drawing. It's got striations of graphite, and it's topped with ovals of ink in red um, and white. I'm sitting with Annette at dinner. And I turned to her to discuss this particular drawing. And I said, you know, Annette, when I saw that drawing, I heard music. Now, I didn't li literally hear Bach, but it conjured up music in my mind. It transports me to music. And this bewildered look came over her face. And she said to me, she paused first. And then in a questioning manner, she said, well, I used to work in a pipe organ factory. Well, I'm sure a bewildered look came over my face, and I'm sure I wasn't breathing. I grew up as a child playing pipe organ. Pipe organ was my major in music school. We looked at each other and said no more. I went home that evening and said, what was that? And that was the moment when I thought something else is going on was my aesthetic. That was not an accident. It was clear that that experience in her life unknowingly found its way into her art. And that experience in my life, unknowingly, found its way to her drawing. Shall I go here? Yeah, yeah, you can keep talking, yeah. Mm -hmm. started a little late. Mm -hmm. We started a little late, yeah. So this is a, um, a work, a big body of work, by Marcus Sivan. Marcus was born and raised in Baltimore. His parents were professors at Johns Hopkins University, and they were um, political and social activists. So he grew up in that kind of atmosphere. I met Marcus when his class at the Maryland Institute College of Art, graduate studies in curatorial work, were using my collection as a resource for project development. And he came to visit me, and I had encouraged him to bring drawings for me to see. And he brought this enormous portfolio, made up of over 60 pages, that were um, ledger paper, yellow ledger paper. And he told me that when the Iraq war broke out, he had such strong feelings, he had to find a way to express them. So instead of marching or protesting, he went to the library to reread War and Peace. Sometime after rereading War and Peace, he created this body of work. And each page is a handwritten transcript artfully presented from some aspect of war and peace. This was his banner. This was his protest. It's absolutely magnificent. So a few days later, the woman who manages my collection came to the studio, and I was so excited to tell her about this body of work. And as I'm explaining it to her, I said it's 60-some pages of, what was that, paper? Ledger. Oh, 60-some pages of ledger paper. And that was the gesture. I said, ledger paper. She looked at me, and I looked at her, and she said, 
what was that? <laughs> what was that gesture? At that moment, I remembered, and I'd been collecting for quite a while, paper. I remembered as a young teenager, I worked in a stationery store. I knew every kind of paper. I sold every kind of paper. Accountants would come in, bring in their ledgers. I would open the book, and I would insert the new ream of ledger paper. That was body memory. I'd never thought of it. I'd been collecting paper for a long time. Never thought about my youth. Never thought about being 12 years old and selling paper. It was the body. So, there, and I could talk about all of these, but I think we're pretty short on time. But this is a taste of the kinds of experiences I continue to have as a collector, where I'm not looking for this. I merely am attracted to something very profoundly, and then I watch for that intrinsic response. If I don't have an intrinsic response, I'm not going to own it. If I have an intrinsic response, I know it has some deeper meaning for me. I don't have to know what that is. I just come to trust it, and I know that it, ha it holds something for me, and the integrity of the whole of my collection is based on that visual and intrinsic response. Over time, sometimes I discover these subtleties. Sometimes I won't. It doesn't matter. And if I do see as an association overtly, I won't own it, because then it blocks me. Then I can't feel the, the drawing. You know, it sort of makes the statement, and it's over for me. And so it's these kinds of experiences that I continue to have and which have led me to really be curious about what else is feeding my aesthetic. It's something much deeper than just visually appealing. And I could tell you more stories about these, but I, I, think you should do I know you that. probably have questions. So I think you should do the land end. Which one? The land end. OK. So this is, um, when I saw this work, I didn't see it hung as an installation. I saw a, st a pile, a stack of drawings. And I looked at them one at a time. And I mean, I just, I was mad for them. I just could feel them so powerfully. I, black is my favorite color, so that's easy to understand. <laughs> but they're so physical. And the artist actually drew those using his forearm or his elbow. And it was a piece that he made sort of as an homage to his father who had died um, some months before. And as I looked piece by piece by piece, I, I mean, it just, I was so responded to it. But before I tell you what happened, I want to see if I can't give you a similar experience. So I want you to look at it, and I look at it sort of at it as a whole, and look at the textures, and look at the grit, look at the color. And then I want you to imagine, and I'm going to push you a little here, but I want you to imagine you're in your car driving to Denver and you're passing a construction site, and they're paving. And you see them with the rakes, and you see the machine, and you see the, the grit of the, of the tar. And you, but most of all, you smell. Can you re just think about that smell as you're passing that zone, that acrid scent, that acrid odor. And as you drive past it, it stays in your nostrils. You can still smell it as you drive beyond. That's the experience I had when I first saw this fully installed. I smelled burnt oil. I smelt the tar very powerfully. And what you need to know is my dad was a trucker, and he paved driveways. I used to draw on the tar. I smelled hot tar all the time. Uh, questions? So just raise your hand if you've got a question. So back to the beginning of your presentation and people really connecting with art and really seeing it, um, what is your thought about the trend in museums today to um, get people involved with their mobile apps and tweeting so that the museums get the biggest hits and the most social media posts as people are looking at art? I worked at a museum in Chicago and they started doing that. I just was pretty offended because I think people should turn their phones off and just be with the art. Uh, everyone can hear me? Cool. Um, you know, it's an interesting give or take, right? There's both negative things and positive things when it comes to something like social media. And obviously, I think that anything that takes us away from that physical experience or distracts from that is missing the point of what the object is really about. Um, and it, at least in the way of like really connecting on this deep level that we're speaking about. However, on the other side of that, 
social media is also not only offering access in, in a lot of different ways to art that people maybe don't have access to, it also is allowing them to reinterpret the art for themselves. And so in posting an image or a few words with it, they're able to sort of control and interpret their own experience of what's valuable. So I think that there's, a, and it is, they actually have like selfie days at the Met and um, you know, that kind of even can relate back to, and forgive my French, but the Vivant Tablet, where they, um, in order to better understand art, you know, people would get together and recreate an actual art scene. So you've kind of seen it with like this, um, The Last Supper or something like that. But in doing that and putting yourself, you know, with the work of art and thinking about the work of art as it reflects to yourself, I think that there's a lot of power to it. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated answer, I guess. Oh, hi. I have a question in regards to the amount of seconds that we're observing these images. And do you, I guess each of you might have a different opinion on this, but do you feel like the, the amount of seconds is continuing to drop? And do you see that as a, as a bad thing? Or um, what's the solution to that, I guess? Or what, you know, with social media, you know, like you said, you can hashtag, you can tweet, you can put all these things out there. Some people in society are doing that. Do you necessarily see that as a bad thing, that the amount of seconds that our attention span is getting less and less, or do you see that, that you know, what's the solution? So I think you bring up a really interesting point um, in that do the seconds matter? Uh, it's a really great illustration, um, but you're right. You know, does it matter how long you're looking? Um, Marty had a statistic that you can make a, you know, uh, make a split judgment about a visual image in 50 milliseconds, yeah, 50 milliseconds something like that. Um, and that's not wrong. I mean, some of these experiments were actually done with people looking at these images for 10 seconds. The issue is the type of attention you're paying. And that gets back to the high cognitive load, low cognitive load issue of, you know, are you actually paying attention to the images on your Instagram feed? Or are you just kind of scrolling through them and not looking? You know, maybe five seconds of intense like viewing is good um, and you know 30 seconds of passively viewing and mostly looking at your phone isn't um, I think it's probably a mixture of you know amount of time and a type of attention uh, and so I think you know going back to the last question of engaging with art it's about what kind of how are we getting people to engage you know is it like are, are people taking selfies and not really looking at what they're doing or are they actually using interactive maps and taking a closer look at information about the art that's in front of them and it's allowing them to come to a greater understanding? You know, that's probably a personal thing from, from person to person, so it's very complicated. Um, but it's, it's, it's about the value, the flavor, uh, all of those different components that go into what you're looking at. And specifically with that study, that study was conducted first in 2001 and then it was reconducted um, in 2015. And the median time changed. I actually don't even think it, it was the average time. No, I, they were using different. medians. They were using medians. We're not, they were I'm using not gonna talk both. statistics right now. I know. <laughs> it basically barely changed at all. So um, I think that the fact that we are capable of taking in a lot of visual information, that's how we see the world. I mean, that's how we're gathering a lot of our information. And we're capable of making sense of it very quickly. That's survival. But then what, what happens when we're not talking survival? What, where are we getting inside of ourselves to think about deeper questions? Mm -hmm. And I think that um, you know, the capability of seeing something, we all have the right to see something and say we're not interested in looking at it further. And you should do that in museums. Go to the thing that connects you. And at that moment, spend a little bit more time and just go past you know, your level of comfort at you know, staring at a work for that amount of time, I would say. So um, the statistical information that you had at the beginning, how much of that, are there any studies that would tell us how much of that is a reflection of what they are told about the art before they get there? So that if a museum says, we've got this fabulous show that we're presenting on this specific period of time, come see it. How much, when they come out after looking at it, each piece for 17 seconds, and say it was wonderful, how much of that is their 
perception of wonderful versus what they were told that it was going to be wonderful? This is a really complicated question. I'm going to give a short answer. If you want to find me afterwards, I'll talk more about it, because I could probably talk about this for a very long time. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, the short answer is, um, again, goes back to you know, attention and cognitive load. Like, if you are told that this is an important piece of work, you're going to see it. Why did you all know the Mona Lisa? Because you've been told it's important, right? You know, if, if, if we lived in a random world where the Mona Lisa was not famous, how many people would know the Mona Lisa? You know, it's, it's about where your attention is being directed and the quality of that attention that you're giving it because you think it's valuable. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop there. Cause <laughs> but I would love to talk more about that. So this is maybe piggybacking off of that, but the, the word context came up a lot uh, in, in your, both of your presentations. And I'm actually really curious um, from all three of you, uh, if I can be so bold, how much uh, context can be a benefit to like activating like all of your senses and looking at art. Um, and as an art professional, sometimes I feel like it can get in the way for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look at Joanne and the way that you approach art uh, in some ways as a very intuitive process where you're able to see the object as an object sometimes outside of its uh, cultural significance. And just, uh, you know, we're a, an art professional and a scientist and a uh, an intuitive looker um, approach that. You want to start? John, you want to start? Marty, if you start. In, con in context, you mean like social context or? Social context or even I would say, I'm going to be specific, but like didactics next to artwork that is supposed to give you insight into what you're seeing. Uh, yeah. But sometimes actually looking at something before you see anything about it. I, I never look at the labels first. In fact, I have a very specific process when I go to see an exhibition. I only go first to what attracts me the most. I don't necessarily go in the order that's dictated. So I start there. And I go in and I look and I back out. And I go in and I look and I back out. And then I become more interested in the details. And then I'll look if I, if I don't understand what the material is or um, certain, how it was made, I will look at the, at the, at the text. But I, I just, I have very specific methods, and I always just look first, and I scan and go to wherever I'm, that magnet is, and then I radiate out from that, and I'll go to it, and I'll go to something else, and then back. So the context is later, and then the context becomes very important. Um, and building off of that, I think it changes the way you connect, right? So, you know, Joanne is very, you know, her entire practice is based off of making a personal connection. Um, and having it be as um, undiluted and pure as possible. You know, if, it's, if there's some other message there, it's just kind of, you know, it dilutes the experience. Um, I think if you are looking at art and paying attention to the didactics and to all this information, you're going to be forming a value judgment, you're going to be getting more info, you're going to be creating a different type of connection than if you didn't look at it and just felt about, like, figured out how you, how you felt about it before looking at anything. And I think that, that that can either enhance or can also get in the way. You know, if, if you have a personal, if you have the potential for a personal connection that is going in one direction, and then you read the didactics and they're going this way, like, it might be pulling you away from your own connection. Or it could work in the other way. So I think it really depends. You know, I, th I think the most profound moments, the most powerful, you know, that moment of awe comes in the unknowing. You know, when the brain is, can't wrap, can't wrap around it. And so I think it's good to approach with the, in the unknowing and, and then let yourself feel and respond and then come back at it another way. Um, we're dictated too much to, and we're all individuals. We're all here and we're all, we can all look at this and we're all gonna see something different. We're all gonna respond differently. And, and that's the way it should be. We shouldn't all see it the same way because we are, we bring ourselves and our life history to the looking. I carry it with me, you carry it with you. And ours are very different. Same way with the artist. But when they intersect, as I described in these couple examples, it's pretty powerful. And it's human to human. And it's real. And it's honest. Yeah, I, I mean, I would reiterate what both of them have said. But the, be the best way to form your own understanding is through your own experience. And 
if you don't allow for that intuitive reaction to happen as a museum professional, as an exhibition maker, the worst thing in the world is to let the interpretation or um, you know, the way that you, your own opinion cloud and get in way of that intuitive reaction. So I think as long as the, you know, that's happening, then going back to that can provide further meaning. And in the same way that if you look at a work of art, connect with it, and then have a conversation with another person or a conversation with the artist, these things can like build to reinforce it. But um, definitely the bane, <laughs> in my opinion, of museums is when the information becomes the thing that we rely on. And I think that we do rely on it, right? Um, for some of the reasons that I said in the presentation, but. You know, I went to see an exhibit at the new museum in New York, and I can't even remember who the artist was, but the thing was, I mean, it was like he was um, a hoarder, and the museum was just full, 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 from floor to floor to floor of all the magazines, all the ephemera that he owned. And I walked through that museum, and I was so overwhelmed. I look all the time. I have a really good aesthetic. I have a really good discipline. I could not take it in. Sometime later, I was seated at a dinner next to one of the associate curators of that exhibit. And I said, who is that exhibit for? What, who's the audience? You know, I, I'm a skilled observer, and I c couldn't take that in. It was just way too much for me. And she said, well, it broke records in attendance. <laughs> and that's all that mattered. And I know that the average person could not go through there possibly. And le they could look at it all and say they saw it all, but they weren't coming away with any kind of meaningful experience whatsoever. Joanne, can I ask, was that a group exhibition? No. Oh, okay. There was a similar one that I absolutely loved. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one? Yeah. Yeah. A broader question. Uh, if the title were visual observation, a mass, uh, matter of mind, I'm curious how much this uh, presentation would have changed as I think of somebody going to a zoo. I think of uh, somebody being on top of a mountain uh, and looking at the scenery. We did a dress rehearsal several weeks ago, and I had a very similar question. And my response is, it doesn't. Um, this, these same principles can apply to anything in life. We can connect not just with the art on the walls, but with nature, with each other, uh, with beauty wherever we see it, um, by following the same principles. Um, it's, it's not just art. You're absolutely correct. But Dale, I do think there's a greater resistance to visual arts. You know, I talk to my friends about having a library. You know, you go into a friend's house and you look at their library and, and you can get an idea of what they're interested in, what they're curious about. You look at that library. You go to a book group and you like biographies, somebody else likes novels and somebody else likes science fiction. There's no judgment there. And you're really interested in how each other differ in, in these preferences. But there's something that happens in, in visual arts. There's a breakdown. People are intimidated by it. They feel like they have to know something. And, and I think that's the barrier that I hope to break, is that you can approach it like you do a novel, you can approach it like you do music, um, in an open way, without judgment. And I think when you're on the top of a mountain is a, is a different thing. But I, I think there's a strong resistance and intimidation in the visual arts. I would also suggest that um, hopefully art and all of this thinking, we do look at our, you know, it should inspire our ordinary life and our daily life. Um, but that there is also the ability of art to have an ambiguity that doesn't fill in answers, that leaves it open-ended. It allows us to bring in different interpretations. So when you look at a mountain, you understand a mountain, and you might have different recollections of what that brings back to you um, from your past or whatever. But when you look at work of art, and I think it's really interesting, Joanne collects abstract art, which is usually one of the hardest things for people to get into because there isn't any form of representation. And you know, the idea of tracing lines and following lines and colors and figuring out where it's going, when you spend enough time with it and that ambiguity allows you to pick up on things that you that are really hard to find and conjure, so. so. I'm interested in the slide that was on the left with the um, uninitiated who looked at the image oh. and it brought calm and it brought mindfulness. I'd like to talk about the application of art as a matter of mind. 
when art is placed in a hospital setting, it brings, it can bring psychological and emotional relief. Would you like to comment, any of you, on that? Um, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think in, in an environment like a hospital that is so aseptic and uh, oftentimes not inviting, it helps to have something that is like a little reflection of yourself. And the more abstract it is, the more potential there is for people to relate to it. So absolutely. Um, and that common piece that can come from just, you know, looking at a bunch of colors can be incredibly therapeutic. I mean, we have art therapy. And maybe, Susan, it's the very thing we're talking about. You're kind of trapped in a hospital, nowhere to go. And you have time. And you're just spending a lot of time gazing, like your friend who looked at the Pollock for however long. I mean, and, and that can be transformative. I think it's the very thing we're talking about. And it's a, yeah. To focus. I can also, um, we ran a program at BMOCA that specifically engaged um, adults that had memory loss, Alzheimer's, dementia, and the it, art was a very powerful tool of allowing them to find things in their memory that they couldn't find. The same comes from education with children. So I think that, um, yeah, I would not, I don't underestimate, I'm advocating for the value of art in that way. And I, you know, I mentioned survival. We're kind of out of survival when we look at art, but I disagree with my own statement. Um, I actually think that it you is. You do that all the time, Mark. I know. Well, there's a lot of contradictions <laughs> in everything that I say, and that's the point. It's complex, and we need to leave room for the contradictions. Um, and that contradiction is that I actually think that art is about survival, and that it is attending to our emotional needs. We don't have the same needs that we had, um, you know cave painting, for instance, that was using visual representation to understand the world around us and understand the animals they were hunting and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're now in a very different world, right? And we need to tend to our emotional needs as we, you know, as society at large, I think. We're, we're done with the questions. Is there anything any of you want to say before anybody might go to look at the exhibit? Well, the reason we didn't let you in there before is because we hope you're going to approach it with a whole different attitude tonight. <laughs> bring your history, bring yourself to the looking, don't listen to the guy next to you. And, you know, don't look for anything, just, just feel. And, and sit with that, go home with that, and see what happens over weeks and see if it comes back to you in some way. It's an experiment, but... And, and Marty's done a wonderful job curating this exhibition in a library that's digital with no books. Mm -hmm. So we're taking the students back to paper and to, and to markings, and we think it's gonna be a pretty exciting time with them. Um, I did want to acknowledge Ben and Andrew, who yesterday were on ladders installing this piece. Our, our they were heroes. like high wire acts, so <laughs> thank you, Ben. Thank you, Andrew. Um, you can also go on my website. Is that on the... Is that anywhere? Yeah, Syzygy yeah. is. Um, and you can see more about what we're doing with the study program. You can also see my 10 principles of practice, which really have stemmed from the experiences I've shared with you. They're, I adhere to them faithfully. Uh, the integrity of the collection depends on it. And I also think that paper is very direct and ephemeral. And I think we're missing paper in our lives. So paper has become um, kind of a rising star in, as a genre. It's becoming more and more dominant in the art scene, and I'm happy we're going back to it. Great. Thank you. So just one last thing before we, before we close this out. I, I always end every program with this, and I just encourage you, if you appreciated tonight's program, if you found it uh, engaging or fun or entertaining, that you tell other people about what we're doing here. You're the best advertising. It doesn't matter how many ads we take out, how many emails we send. When somebody hears from somebody that they believe in that says, hey, I went to this program, it was really interesting or very entertaining, that will make them come. And we want to be, have to be in bigger and bigger venues because we are so fortunate to bring wonderful people and we want everybody to have the experience. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you.